All right. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Good, good. Danny, how are you doing? Well, oh, doing great. Thanks so much for joining us today on the podcast. We were we were just talking about how long it's been, and I think you've been on twice. I know the first time was episode five, which was it seems like a million years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's been twice, they you know they say the third time's a charm. So here we go, my friend. Yeah, it's gonna be the the perfect. One. <laughs> Not that those weren't any good. I liked all, all you having you on, and yeah, why why you're on here again. Um, so for people that maybe haven't heard those episodes, I'd love to start with just your story, you know, of how you got into this business and, and your path of success in it and, uh, and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I talk about this, uh, you know, I always like, well, is there, well, there's like a short version and a long version, right? But, um, you know, I've been an investor for about 10 and a half years now, I guess. And, uh, before that I was, um, and my wife and I started our business together. So we both were what we kind of, I kind of refer to as corporate refugees. Yeah. So we left our jobs and we started really investing in 08. But uh, my wife left her job a little bit before that because our son was born. And then I had, uh, you know, probably a story that's different, but, but relatable to maybe a lot of people listening here is I was in corporate America. So this is like 06 and I had a job that I really liked. Uh, in fact, I kind of referred to as my, at the time, my dream job. It was a great, it was a great job, but I, I got fired one day and uh, it was part of a, ultimately a pretty big downsizing. So I worked for uh, Radio Shack, which we, as we all know, is kind of gone now, right? But at the time it was like a $5 billion a year company with 35,000 employees and it's based, uh, you know, not far from where I live. So, um, but it was, there was a lot of legacy there and it was just a good culture and lots of, you know, there was this movement to try to like, take this dinosaur into the new era really. And so it was a lot of, you know, I was kind of on the cutting edge, I guess, of a lot of strategy stuff of how to, how to revitalize the company. And, uh, and then out of nowhere, you know, just got, got fired one day, kind of blindsided, thought I was like the golden boy. Like I, I could do no wrong. And then I lost my job, you know, so um, unexpected. And then for me at the time, after that, you know, kind of like you can work again? as much as you want. Feel like it's not in your control at that point. Yeah, that, that's really the first time. I mean, I had never been fired from a job. I mean, I've left some jobs and moved on, and but that was the first time that I had ever been like, you know, doing something that I really liked and it got taken away from me, I guess. And um, for me at the time, my wife and I were, we had just been married for, I guess, a, a, about a year and a half at that point. And so, you know, we were both pro professionals, corporate professionals, if you will. And um, it was a little bit of a blow to my ego, honestly. And uh, so now here I am, I'm like married and supposed to be the supportive husband, even though my wife was making more money than me, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but all of a sudden, like, I'm like the unemployed guy that, you know, uh, is having a hard time finding the next job. So anyway, I found another job and went uh, to work for, um, I say it was a startup. At, at the time I joined, they had grown pretty fast up to like a 500 million a year in sales. So it was a startup that was, you know, had grown from nothing to about a half a billion dollars in sales in, in three or four years. Uh, so seemingly they could do no wrong. And I was there. It was great, cool culture, lots of good stuff going on. And then one day they filed for bankruptcy. And yeah. it was just like this, you know, this realization of for me. Now, I decided to leave the company, but I would have been made to leave eventually. So yeah. um, but at that point, you know, our son was just born. And so and then my wife had left her job. Uh, because my my job was going so well. Um, and so it was this kind of realization. So this brings us to like, you know, kind of back half of 07. And um, just this realization of like, wow, I'm, I'm a new dad. My son was two months old, by the way. So wow. new dad, my wife had left her job. So now we have no income and a baby. And we had actually, this job was in Washington, D.C. So as you know, we live in Dallas, but we had moved away from Dallas to uh, Washington, D.C., no family there, new baby, no job. Like, what the heck are we doing? <laughs> and so it was, it was a little bit of a scary time. You know, I mean, I've heard, you know, these are first world problems. Like, I've, you know, I've heard of worse problems. But for me, it was, um, it was a time to kind of reflect and say, like, what do I want to be when I grow up here? Now I've got people responsible for me. I've got a baby responsible for me. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I did the, uh, the thing that any, uh, respectable or responsible person would do. And I dove into real estate investing <laughs> <laughs> in 2008 when the market was slipping. So, um, yeah, so we got, we got started. How, in how did you, how did you find out about it? I mean, what, what caused you, did you know somebody that was doing it? Did you read a book? Uh, I knew a few people, 
um, I won't say that I knew anybody that was like, I need to do exactly what this guy's done. Um, the whole world that we know now of wholesaling and this whole industry, it was, it's, it's largely underground, right? For people that aren't a part of it. Like you just, you know, not that, not that everybody is like me, but at the time I thought all real estate happened through agents and the MLS and stuff like that. I just wasn't aware of the whole industry at the time. And so, um, you know, I, I guess I knew enough to know that working for somebody else, uh, I'm, I'm basically, um, I don't have control, right? Um, I'm not responding, no matter, and truthfully, I've always been a workaholic. So no matter where I worked, I always worked really hard. And in hindsight now, I always worked really hard for somebody else, right? And so it was just this reflection of like, look, I have to take this into my own hands and I don't even know what that means right now, but um, I've got to take responsibility for my family's future here and my own future. And, um, and isn't so, it, isn't yeah. that cool though? I mean, how like out of that adversity, had you not had that adversity, yeah. would you still be working that job? Probably. You know? and, Probably. And you know, there's people that I, cause I do a lot of coaching and stuff now. So I talk to people all the time that are in a job that they hate, but it's yet it's, it, it appears to be a steady paycheck, right? It's like, it's, they're not in enough pain to jump ship. Um, but that pain could be inflicted tomorrow and they'd have no control, you know? And so, but for me, it was a time to just say, look, I've got to do something different here. And, and I'd, honestly, I'd, I'd always been interested in real estate investing without really knowing what that means in hindsight. Mm -hmm. You know, I just knew that like flipping houses was something that I wanted to do. And truthfully, 08, that was really before the house flipping shows were on, you know, on TV. Well, flip I think. this house. Didn't they have flip this house back then? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Well, what was that maybe one in some... South Carolina? I think trademark properties. Do you remember? Yeah. That? Maybe some early ones. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's all that I really knew. And honestly, even at that point, I didn't even know anything about wholesaling. I wanted to fix and flip houses and, um, and, uh, that's what I wanted to do. Right. But then when I got in business, I quickly realized, uh, learned about wholesaling and realized that, you know, when you're a new business, you got to get cash in the door a lot faster. And so, um, we, we started wholesaling, you know, uh, probably 50 or 60% of our deals, um, pretty quickly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I just, you know, honestly, I, I, I was pretty naive to the market even in 08 to know that it was because people started to, people that had some experience started to say to us, like, it's a terrible time to get in. Why are you getting in the market right now? In hindsight, it was a really good time to get in. Right. Uh, because the down market is, uh, is where we can, where we can shine if, if you've prepared for it. Right. Um, but I didn't know any of that at the time. It just was circumstance that and coincidence that we got in it at what I think is a good time actually. Yeah. So how did you deal with that down market? What were you guys doing uh, that other people were having trouble doing? Well, you know, you know, the big thing, cause you, you've been investing, how long have you been investing for? Since 2003, right? Yeah. So another five years on top of me. So, you know, one of the first things that happens in a down market is a lot of the credit starts to tighten up. Right. And so a lot of the competition that we're feeling now uh, from a lot of maybe newer investors that truthfully don't know. So a lot of, I'm, I'm not, by the way, I work with a lot of new investors. So, but there are a lot of people that truly don't know what they're doing. You know that. And, um, and might do one deal and get wiped out, but it doesn't mean that they didn't screw that up for the rest of the investors <laughs> to yeah. take that deal away. Like the seller might have benefited because they got twenty or thirty thousand dollars more for a house than what they should have. Um, but um, anyway, that's how the market works, right? But a lot of those that credit starts to tighten up, and a lot of those people start to go away. And so we were fortunate um, that when we got in, we had access to um, a private lender. And they, and they connected us with a local bank that really had not done a lot of real estate stuff up to that point. So when a lot of lenders were pulling away from real estate, this one was like, yeah, we could fit it into our portfolio. And so we had access to some capital. So it didn't really slow us down for, for doing rehabs. And, and we just had, um, you know, we kind of uh, learned early on that you got to buy deep. And so we just always went, that, those were the days where you're buying it. 60, 65% or under, right? right? So that's obviously a lot of pressure on that these days, but, um, but yeah, we were pretty disciplined and, and I think all those things that had happened to me up to that point of, um, kind of having to survive, if you will, really forced us to just slam on the gas. So we just worked really, really hard to build our business in the early years. Not that we don't still work hard, but it was like 
all hands on deck for the first like five years we were in business of building. Yeah. So I wanted to get into a little bit more of the, um, the working with the bank, you know, if you guys were newer investors, how did that work out? How did you, you know, talk with them and build that relationship? So they were willing to do that. Were you showing them examples of deals that you were doing? Yeah. Or? Yeah. What we did early on is, you know, these things are like, now you look back and you, I don't have to do those things because I have hundreds of deals under my belt that I can go back and, or a reputation, at least in my market uh, to where, you know, it's easier to find lending, to find deals. It's easier to work with lenders right now than it has been in the 10 and a half years I've been in business. Right. Um, and the funny thing now is I don't, I don't need those new lenders. Like I have relationships with the other ones I have. There is a lesson there though, of you should have uh, lots of relationships with lenders, by the way. Um, when the times are good, because some of those people that you think you can work with now or that want to work with you might go away in a down market. But um, yeah, for sure. That was one of the things that we did. We created a, a binder. We like had it bat like spiral bound book. I'm of, sorry. I gotta, I gotta stop you real quick with the volume cut is going low and then high again. Okay. Is that, is that something on your mic or your uh, computer? Shouldn't, shouldn't be. Let me pull my mic a little bit closer here. Does that sound, sound better now? Uh, it's still quiet. I didn't touch anything here and I do a lot of recording. Yeah, let me check my. Uh, okay. I mean, I've got my volume at the normal level. It's. Yeah. But it's just it's like I hear it slowly getting quieter, and then it goes up and it's louder. I can make sure somehow my settings didn't get changed to like a different mic or something. But uh, hang on here, because I use Zoom too, actually. Uh, these are all my normal settings. I don't see anything at my end that I can change from what I normally have. So everything looks the same like you'd normally. Yeah, everything seems to be even the tests. Everything seems to be okay at my end. Yeah, maybe it's just because it's getting louder out here because of the rain. Yeah, it's raining. It's raining here too. It's not super hard right now, but it, it has been recently. All right. We'll just have you speak up just a little bit if you don't mind, and we'll okay. keep going, and I'll edit that part okay. out. Yeah, I can try to. Let me try to pull my. I don't want to. That pull sounds. My microphone in the picture now, but. Yeah, that sounds a little bit better. It's a little bit closer, so maybe that'd be better. Yeah, it's not in the picture. So um, i trying to think of exactly where we Yeah, so that you were talking about what you took in, like you had a credibility thing or something. Yeah, like okay. So yeah, when we met with banks, we, um, we, we realized we had to show them something. And, and talking with them, they, they understand. I mean, they're, they're savvy people financially. They understand uh, what they'll lend against and what they won't. But when we started to show them deals, so we created a booklet of maybe it was 10 or 15, the last 10 or 15 deals that we did. And we made it very clear, like we haven't left anything out. Like these are our most recent deals. It's not like we're just showing you the good ones. And, um, and we showed them the numbers and we showed them before and after pictures because everybody, uh, everybody likes that, right? They like, they like to see what actually happened there. That's probably what they looked at more than the numbers. Right? <laughs> probably. <laughs> even the bankers, yeah. But, but one thing that they definitely looked at is over and over again, they would say, how did you buy that for so low? Like they just didn't really get our model of marketing directly to sellers and you know buying distressed properties and so i think kind of the proof was in the pudding at that point they're like they kind of got our model and you know they set some criteria up that they'll lend up to a certain point that when you look at the numbers for the way that a lot of bank structure deals and the way that we buy houses right it's like it'd be very very hard for a lender to lose you know and so that was the beginning and as time went by, then they would expand our line and uh, to a point to where they would expand it more if we wanted more. But it's like, well, we don't, I don't want to just expand it for the point of expanding it. Like I don't really need any more uh, than that. So yeah, that, that was a, I mean, hopefully people that are listening here can realize that now sometimes the question is, cause I coach a lot of people. Sometimes the question is, is like, well, what if I don't have those deals yet? How do I go to a bank and say, so, you know, if you're working with a mentor or a coach, sometimes you can, 
you can kind of use their deals. Like don't say that they were your deals, but just say, I work with a mentor and a coach that's teaching me how to do these things. And these are, these are their most recent deals just to give some perspective. Like, so don't lie about anything, but um, sometimes, you know, just having that visual cue and some examples of what you're talking about, I think really helps people visualize uh, what we do as investors. Right. And it's like you said, it's, it's kind of hard for them to, to, uh, you know, imagine that people are buying that many properties at that kind of discount, right? Like that's a, right. That, that's a sustainable thing that you can continue to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So it sounds like you pretty much, you know, have really done well with building relationships and, um, you know, what other, what other relationships and other things have you, you done as you've grown as an investor? Yeah, I think, you know, um, if I look back from the beginning, I would say this, uh, the first maybe year I was in business, I, I was, um, I didn't really network a lot. I mean, honestly, the industry was kind of new to me. Like I didn't, I knew there were real estate clubs, but when I went there and, and I'm, I, I like real estate clubs, so don't get me wrong, but a lot of real estate clubs that I went to, you know, there tend to be a lot of, it's like the blind leading the blind. There's a lot of brand new people that are there to learn, but everybody else there is brand new. And so and sometimes it's hard to get good value there, but there are some really good clubs in DFW now, but over time that's changed. There's some that aren't that great. And all of a sudden a really good one pops up. Um, but uh, you know, for a long time, I was just so focused on building our business for the first year that I didn't really do a lot of networking. I, I would, every once in a while I would get on some wholesalers lists and start to get other deals. And I like, it's like, I didn't want to work with other wholesalers. I didn't want to, I don't want to, I don't, I just like, for some reason I was like, I, I didn't say this, but I was like, I don't really like that guy in my mind. I was like, well, why? Well, cause he's my competitor, you know? It's like, yeah, but there's like thousands of competitors here. And in my market, it's seven and a half million people. Like there's room for a lot of us. Right. And so, but anyway, I was just closed minded at the beginning. And some of it was just like, being in kind of feast or famine mode, right? Of I've got to build this thing. And then what happened was I did a deal with somebody and then I, I actually uh, met this guy for a beer and I was like, man, I really like this guy. Like our fam, we live pretty close together. Our families seem like we're at the same stage. Like you start to realize like, man, I've been so blind to why wouldn't I want to be around more people like me? And, um, and so what happened is I started to work with other people. I started to network and then I started to share even more about what I was doing. Cause I realized that there's a lot of people back to that Rhea club statement of the blind leading the blind. Like maybe there's a way for me to share my knowledge with people and, um, and in exchange one, make some new friends and, and also maybe find ways to do deals with people or find more money or uh, find other people to wholesale to. Right. And so um, I started doing, um, I started uh, being a sponsor at one of the real estate clubs and uh, I started doing this thing that I kind of coined rehab live where I would basically, cause at the time we were rehabbing five, six, seven houses at any given time, if not more. And so I, um, at the time we have systems pretty di a lot more dialed in now, now than we did then. But even then I had a pretty good contractor in place, same contractor, uh, that I use now is rehab hundreds of houses for me. And in fact, we're such good friends now. We have season tickets at the stars games, hockey games. We have a game tonight side by side. So we're like, you know, he's like a brother to me now. Uh, but at the time, um, you know, I didn't have to check them. I checked on my properties like once a week, mm -hmm. I would drive around and check on them. Now I, I go for 15 minutes at the beginning. If I go at all, 15 minutes at the end to check it out, a couple text messages and things just get done. Cause we do them all the same way pretty much. But yeah. At the time I was like, well, let me just once a week when I'm checking on a property, why don't I just schedule some more time there and just have people come, come meet me there and talk about it. And so this rehab live thing, what we did is we said, Hey, meet me at a house. I wait, just, I'm going to start this one on this house that I'm about to close on. And we would usually meet like the day after closing. Sometimes we would even meet like the day before closing if the house was vacant. And I would say, Hey, we're, we're about to close on this thing or we just closed on it. And purposely, I would always pick the nastiest ones because, you know, you're going to see <laughs> the biggest transformation. Yeah. yeah, you got to, I had to, I had to sprinkle in some drama there. I mean, they're real houses. It's not like I made them that way, but, you know, the ones that are just painted carpet wouldn't have been as fun. And so, um, yeah, they got to smell the money, right? When they go in, they got to be able to smell the money. Yeah, exactly. Have the, where the shirts and that's what I would say sometimes. I'm like, look, do not wear, do not wear open toe shoes. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, um, cheerfully, you know, some of the nasty houses we buy. Um, 
So we would meet there three times, like once right at the beginning uh, before we've done anything. And then two weeks later when we're about halfway done and then two weeks later when we're totally done. And at the end, the last, the last meeting, we'd usually, you know, we usually sit in the living room, just sit on the floor. I mean, it's a newly rehabbed house at that point. And we would order pizzas or something like that. Just kind of sit around and talk about it. Like, well, why did That's you decide cool. to unconvert that garage or why did you decide to do this or that or what did that cost or who's the contractor you used for that and so it would just be these awesome conversations and um you know for me some of it was like ego maybe a little bit like hey i'm i'm doing what a lot of you want to do maybe right. some of it was an opportunity i'm kind of a social creature and so some of it was just an opportunity to just make some new friends and meet people and then some of it, um, really, this was not my primary motivation, but started to happen is like, I'd find people that I could do deals with or people that were interested in coaching or people that, uh, you know, would say, Hey, I'm a real estate agent. I find houses like this. Would you be interested in them? Cause I don't want to list these things. And, you know, lots of things came out of just networking and sharing what I know. And that, that probably is how I would define kind of my whole real estate investing career really from that point forward, everything I do with flip nerd and our podcast and our masterminds has been sharing what I know and pulling people together to share knowledge because so many good things have come from that. Yeah, that's cool. So how many people at those houses when you were taking them over to your rehabs, you know, what yeah, were the so numbers like? It would be, it'd be common to have somewhere between 20 and 40 people uh, there. Wow. That's quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, the neighbors are freaking out. Like also that house was vacant. Why are there 40 people there now? <laughs> but it just, you know, we would just tell people, Hey, we're improving the, we're about to improve your neighborhood. So, right. Um, right. You know, be patient with us. So when you coach people, when you start to coach people, what are some of the things that you start with? What are the common problems that you see people are having the hurdles that are keeping them from, from taking action? And how do you, get them over those hurdles? Yeah. I mean, a common thing that we probably do differently is we really focus on the person setting goals and then building an action plan around meeting those goals and just kind of backing into it. So <clears throat> there's so many people that fall in love with the hype or the dream or the idea of making money in real estate and quitting their job and all that. But the reality is if they don't treat it like a business, they're never going to get there. Right. And so you know, you'll, there's a lot of other coaching programs out there that'll be like, no, you don't set up legal entities, just start hustling hard and do this and do that. And we're like, look, you got to sound, you got to set up a foundation. Like you, you have to really build a business here. And so, you know, it's some of the stuff that we do up front is, uh, is, is not sexy, uh, but it's the stuff you have to do to kind of lay the foundation to build a real business on. So, um, but yeah, that's a, a lot of it is focused on, um, on, just getting the foundation set and truly setting up some lead generation tactics that, that will bring leads in because as you know, without leads, I mean, you don't even have a nothing business. Nothing else matters. Yeah. It doesn't matter how bad you want it. If you don't have leads, nothing else matters. Right. Yeah. What, uh, what are some of the things that you've seen that people have, have done when you've given them the advice of setting up that foundation, setting up those goals? What are some of the things that you've seen that people, it's almost like a sure sign that they're just not, the right fit for this business uh, yeah. is there anything that you've seen that comes up that you guys notice it's like hey this person's probably needs a little bit extra help or is probably just not gonna it's not yeah uh, we um you know it's interesting because uh there's a lot of people that this is so I've, I've been coaching for um a long time maybe nine years and uh, i started doing it early on and have a lot of uh, i mean i know our students have bought thousands of houses so we have a lot of success stories but with, there's also people that buy coaching or get into coaching and even though they paid for it, they like don't come to anything. They don't follow what we're saying at all. They may not even be doing anything. And, um, and so what I found is, you know, you gotta, you've got to want it, right? You've yeah. got to want it bad enough. And I feel like there's a lot of people that want it. They want the dream, but they don't want to do the work. And, um, and I think a lot of the TV shows and stuff over time have, have made this business look easy, right? But this is not an easy business, as you know. It's it's hard, and there's a lot of little things that pop up, and it's not like hard, like rolling a boulder up a hill necessarily. But it's yeah. just this constant strain of little things that just kind of burn you out or can wear you out. And until you get processes and systems set up to just make that easier, or yeah. mentally to know how to deal with it more, or just say that sucks. But you know, if I have a bad attitude about it, it's going to make it harder. Yeah, so there's, there's, a, 
there's a reason why the TV shows don't show the 90% of the rest of the business. <laughs> right. Right. It's just yeah. that they've already magically got the deal. Right. And it's not even that bad, really. It's just a paint and carpet job or something. Right, right, right. And yeah. Have so much fun swinging the sledgehammer, knocking the cabinets out. Right. You know, but they don't show <laughs> the contractor not showing up or the contractor disappearing with $2,000 of the materials or being, uh, you know, arrested and your sighting ends up in the impound yard with his car and trailer. <laughs> right. <You> know, <laughs> like all yeah. this stuff that happens. All that stuff, all that yeah. stuff. But yeah, I think, um, you know, if I would say that uh, what I found, and this is kind of hard because I, I do believe that when people start this business, it is possible to start part-time. Um, but I do think the people that I've seen that have kind of burned the boats, kind of like I did, like we chose not to go back into corporate America and stuff. The people that really are kind of all in and commit are the ones that I've seen do the best. Now, I don't want to discourage people that can't go all in, but you just, they just have to, what we tell people is like, look, you might not be able to leave your job right now, but you can't come home and like start watching TV for four hours every night. And like, you've got two jobs now. Right. And, um, so the, the, the truth is, is there's a lot of people that have been to a lot of seminars and stuff and, they haven't heard that message before with it because they're usually selling the hype of it being easy and then, you know, fizzling out. But we kind of feed people the truth of like, look, this is a hard business, but if you want it bad enough, it could be a great business. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find some people have trouble? Uh, because you're, you're talking about you, you coach doing motivated saw marketing, right? Getting those leads. Yeah. All right. And do you find that there's a hang up with people on, on going to people's houses or, or feeling like they're taking advantage of people? Um, sometimes people feel that way. And, you know, I think um, what you start to realize, I mean, you and I have enough experience to know that I've, I've talked to, gosh, I don't even, I, I have no way to like even know how many people over 10 years, but 10,000 home sellers, you know, um, that we've never taken advantage of a single person. You know, we, we just kind of present it as I have an op, an option for you. And by the way, it's probably not the right fit for you. But if you want time and convenience and to make this super easy and to go away, then this is my, my option. And so I think that, uh, you know, I had a conversation with one of our students here recently who didn't want to kind of buy on our formula. Like he didn't, he, he wanted to basically over way overpay for the house to kind of help the guy out. And I just said, look, um, I appreciate that you want to help. Like you have to separate your business from charity. Like you, you can do other good things with the money you make. They can go do things, but he felt kind of guilty uh, in this one specific instance. It was somebody that he knew it was like a friend of a friend type thing. And I just said, you, the numbers he was talking about buying is like, you, you might break even or worse on that. Right. And um, so you've got to be principled in your business. And at the end of the day, you know, I don't feel like we've ever taken advantage of anybody. There's not a single person on hundreds and hundreds of deals that could ever come back and say, I really didn't want to sell you my house, but you forced me to. Like, yeah. That's just never happened, right? And yeah, I, I think usually say, look, every single person we bought a house from, every single one of them wishes they could have gotten more for the house. And every single one of them, I wish I could have paid less for it. But that's just how markets work. Like we right. came to terms and that was good enough for us to move forward at that point. Well, we see what we want to see. And so if we're coming from the perspective of, hey, I'm taking advantage, that might not be at all how that person feels. And if they did feel that way, they wouldn't do business with you. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I think it's, it's way over, over thought because people just, they want to be done with their problem. Yep, I agree. Like that's, that's really what it all boils down to. And if you're not facing that situation, you don't understand how that feels, that pressure that's been on them for probably years. Um, to be able to get that relieved from them is what they really yeah, care no about. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. But um, yeah, so what else do you uh, do in your your programs? Um, in terms of coaching or masterminds? Yeah, or? yeah, coaching. Yeah, the coaching stuff. You know, we what we do is we really focus on um, we really focus on providing a lot of good support for people because we found that it's easy for people to stray. And, uh, you know, it's easy for people to get distracted. Like we're talking about single family homes. The next thing you know, somebody wants to start buying mobile homes or self storage or multifamily. And so we, we do our best to try to keep people focused. And like you could go do, I'm actually, you know, I've been doing this for 10 and a half years. I'm 
finally right now uh, doing a, a multifamily deal with a friend of mine that's an expert in that space. Um, but I, I, uh, you know, I would say that I have shiny object syndrome, but I've done a pretty good job of staying focused over until I built this business up. So it's really important that people stay focused and we try to help them stay focused. Yeah, that's a big, big part of it because it easy, easy, it is easy to spend the time like learning that new shiny part of it. Like yeah. I'm going to go learn about this and you got to stop yourself and saying, are you avoiding something by doing that? Is the reason why you were so excited about that is because you're avoiding doing the uncomfortable thing in the main part of the business. No doubt. Yeah. Right. And uh, what was this? I forgot which book it was, but I was feeling pretty stressed out this morning <clears throat> and I was like, why am I so stressed out? And Th this book I had read recently was talking about whenever you're feeling pretty stressed out or you're worried about something, it's usually because you're avoiding something. You're not doing something. And if you just find out what that thing is that you're avoiding and do it, it takes away all of that. Yeah. So I knew immediately what it was. And so I set about doing it. In fact, it was, it was last night, all this started yesterday. And I came back into the office last night just to start chipping away at it so that I could, you know, and it did, it changed everything from, from that point, but just, Stopping to yep. say, hey, what am I avoiding right now that I should be doing and uh, doing that? Yeah. Yeah. I think for new investors, you know, since we've been talking about new investors, the important thing is um, this is a pretty easy business to reverse engineer. I mean, you have to make some assumptions, but if you say, hey, it takes me 30 leads to get one deal or 20 leads to get a deal, whatever it is, you know, we tell people, look, don't, don't be thinking in your head, I want to buy a house a month. Say to yourself, I need to figure out how to get 30 leads a month. How do I get 30 leads? By the way, that's seven and a half leads a week. So here we are halfway through the week. How many leads do you have this week? If you don't have three and a half, then you're not on track, you know? Yeah. And just every day, I mean, as you know, you just it's a systematic approach to every day, I have a stepping stone that I need to hit. Otherwise, I'm not gonna hit that uh, stepping stone in a month from now or a week from now, right? And so it's just a systematic approach. And it's not sexy, as you know. This business is not sexy. You know, I think uh, cable TV has tried to make it sexy. Yeah. But the best performing real estate investing businesses that I know of are boring as hell, right? They're op just this operational process of things happening. If there's any drama, then something bad has happened, right? It should be non-sexy. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't sell books or training or anything else. So a lot of times people don't like the, hear the, the sound of that. But that's the reality, though. Right, right. Well, there's something exciting about having you know, measured risks and, uh, and, and big rewards, yeah. you know, capable in this business, which aren't very, you know, in, in a lot of other industries, uh, probably not very many that match this kind of level of what you can make on one deal. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, the money and the opportunity, opportunity is sexy, but I mean the op day to day operations of this business, like it shouldn't, there shouldn't be a bunch of drama. Like nobody really throws a sledgehammer through a window when they're mad. Like you, if you're doing that, you're like an idiot, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's, I've never done that. I've never done donuts in the front yard of a house because I'm mad at a contractor or any of the things you've seen on TV. Yeah. Um, and that's the stuff that adds a lot of drama to it, but that's just not the real world. Yeah. <laughs> we have other drama like people stealing appliances or, um, you know, permit issues or whatever. <laughs> yeah. We've had, we've had a whole house of staging furniture stolen before. I guess we yeah. staged it too nice. You know, somebody wanted that for their home. So. <laughs> this will look really good in my yeah. house. Yeah. Yeah. Most of it's just like painted furniture that we got from uh, like, you know, um, what's it called? Like Habitat for Humanity and some of those other stuff. Okay. Like stores. Goodwill. Yep. Different cheap stuff. But anyway, it looks good, right? I mean, that's all that matters in staging. Yeah. So for your, your coaching students or, or even your, just your friends or anybody else looking to get in this business, is there... Are there any kind of books or any, any other things that you recommend for people? Um, you know, I don't have any books. I, I, uh, I read a lot of books. So I've kind of drawn a blank on any specific uh, books to go after. I mean, I think Think and Grow Rich is a good one. Honestly, I, I, I think uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a great book. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, the reality is, is Kiyosaki sold his training company years ago and they've now they're changing the name from everything. Uh, but the fundamentals that you learn in those books, uh, the rich dad books are really good. Um, and I think the idea behind, you know, uh, there's another book called the cash flow quadrant, which is another rich dad book. Mm -hmm. So I talk about that quite a bit um, because there's these four quadrants. If you have a minute, we'll kind of talk about it to folks, which I know you're probably familiar with Danny is 
the four quadrants are you're an employee for somebody else or you are self-employed. So you have a business, but you're really just working for yourself. You have a business and you have employees or you are an investor and you don't have employees and you make money from your money, right? And so that's kind of the, the transition. Uh, that's the process where you go through. Everybody wants to get to that fourth quadrant of my money just works for me. If I'm on the beach, it doesn't even matter, right? And um, so what we found is there's a lot of people that are stuck either as an employee or they're, truthfully, you, you probably know, that you would agree with this, I bet. A lot of real estate investors are really self-employed, right? They, they're doing everything themselves. They don't have systems and processes in place. They're not like they could. And, you know, I'd argue that a lot of real estate investors, almost every real estate investor, like nobody is attracted to the freedom that real estate can give you um, and attracted to the piece of, well, I actually want to do everything in my business and I don't ever want to take any time off and I don't want to be able to spend more time with my family and I just want to be able to do everything. And if I'm sick, then my business stops. And, but that's where they get stuck, right? Is uh, because they don't have those systems and processes in place. And so, you know, I would, I, I think what happens is, is people assume that they have to go from that first quadrant that I talked about of being an employee to being self-employed to being um, a business owner with employees to being totally independent. And I think the more you can try to make that leap to being self-employed as short as possible of a leap, um, the better. And a lot of that happens, as you know, with scale, right? You, you can't afford to hire employees if you're doing even one house a month. Like there's not enough profit to pay your employees, pay for your marketing and live a nice lifestyle. So you've got to get up to two, three, four deals a month as fast as possible so that you have a real business. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the part that for us at least was like, Hey, wait a minute. I thought we were doing this for freedom. I didn't want to set up a, a real business and have people to be responsible for. And, and for a long time we didn't do anything because we, we're trying to avoid that. And it is kind of like, you know, now that you're saying it and I'm hearing you, it's kind of weird because it's like you, know, you get into the business for freedom, right? And then you find out, hey, wait a minute, why am I, I'm working more than I ever worked. Yeah. But for a lot of us, it's so exciting, you know, doing the business and getting these houses and the deals and potential that we don't see it as work at first, you know, for a long time. Right. And uh, then you, yeah, you realize, Hey, wait a minute. Like if I stop, everything stops, or I've always got to deal with the problems that come up and it gets kind of old. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. But uh, yeah, putting those, those, those pieces in place. Um, does your coaching go up through that part of the, the actually like hiring and the team building and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, we talk, we talk about it. I mean, probably our, most of our coaching is early stage, like uh, newer investors, now we have, you know, what we do is, you know, we have a mastermind investor fuel that we run that is for more experienced investors. So we have a couple of groups there and that's people that are doing 10 to 50 deals a year or 50 or more deals a year. So, you know, there's people in our group that are doing three or 400 deals a year and those people are not doing everything themselves. They couldn't. Right. right. And so um, in terms of the way I guess I serve the real estate investing community is we have a ton of free content on flip nerd and our podcasts and, uh, I think we have, uh, we've had a few different podcasts over the years. We have over 1500 different episodes of our various podcasts. And um, then we have uh, more getting started or doing a few deals here and there and need to take it to another level type coaching. Um, and then we have the masterminds to help people kind of grow from that self-employed to business owner to uh, being independent. Yeah. Very cool. Sounds like got, got everything there from, from start to finish. <laughs> well, it didn't, you know, it wasn't always that way. And, uh, and honestly, I, you know what I've, I'm still actively, we're rehabbing several houses right now. We're still active investors for sure. But I'll tell you that I really love talking to people, guys like you and, uh, and I love coaching and mentoring uh, other people and helping connect people. I've honestly, if I even go back to my early years in like high school and things like that, I, I was always a connector. Like who do I know that I can introduce you to, to add value to you and, you know, maybe somewhere around, you know, karma comes back into play and that benefits me. And I've always been that connector type person. And so now I'm kind of blessed to be able to do that professionally. Yeah, very cool. I appreciate you taking the time to share with us on this episode of the Flippy Junkie podcast. And if anybody out there is listening, wants to get a hold of you or find out a little bit more about what you do, how, where should they go? 
Yeah, they can just go to flipnerd.com. If if you're interested in coaching, we have information on there. If you're interested in the masterminds, we have information on there. And we have a whole bunch of uh, free content, a couple episodes with, uh, with you, Danny over the years. And so, uh, that's, that's where most of our stuff is, is on, uh, on flipnerd.com. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again. And, uh, keep in touch. Absolutely. Stay dry. Yeah. Trying to stay dry here. It's been raining like cats and dogs for sure. So thanks Danny. Yep. Have a good one.